make sure you just go fast every time you run, you know, at, at some point, you know, towards the end of the run, do, you know, three to four to 10, um, uh, sprints, quick sprints, 10 seconds, uh, full range of motion, just as fast as you can, you make things move. That triathlon show, 160. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Jonathan Beverly on the topic of running form and mechanics once again. We recently did that in episodes 110 and 111. 111 uh, but uh, Jonathan is uh, the author of Your Best Stride which is a book where he he describes basically his search for common ground among the world's top coaches biomechanical researchers physicians and physiotherapists and uh, and he describes how all agree that basically that there's no one ideal running style but there are a few things that uh, that are common that everybody should try to to adopt and that they these things can often get compromised by our daily habits so that's what we'll get into uh, Jonathan describes how there are clear and straightforward ways to restore the mobility, strength, balance and posture that are necessary to, to help every runner uh, regain their best and ef- most efficient running pattern. So a little bit more about Jonathan. In addition to Your Best Stride, he has written the book Run Strong, Stay Hungry and he used to be the editor of Running Times. And he has also coached runners for a long, long, long time and been a lifelong runner himself. One great thing that I found about uh, running Your Best Stride, sorry, is uh, a review by Alex Hutchinson, our guest back in episode 101. And uh, Alex, who is a journalist, a great journalist and author himself, wrote that this is the post-fad, post-backlash, post-whiplash book we've been waiting for, taking advantage of the huge surge of interest and research into running form in recent years to move beyond all the turf wars and look at what we've actually learned. So that basically tells you all you need to know about your best stride. And we'll get right into that topic after we thank our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that make the best electrolyte products on the market for optimal performance and no more cramps. And as I mentioned in a recent episode, they recently published their annual cramping survey results. And uh, this can be found on their website. Uh, The article is called Are Athletes Winning the World War on Cramps? And there are a lot of interesting takeaways. I won't get much into them right now, but uh, it suffice it to say that if you tend to suffer from cramps uh, somewhat regularly, then you have to go and check it out because there is so much that you can learn from it. And as you are well aware by now, you can get your first box or tube of electrolyte product on precisionhydration.com for free when you use the promo code that triathlon show, all one word all caps. This episode is also sponsored by Stack. They are the manufacturer of the world's quietest indoor bike trainer, the Stack Zero. And as I mentioned last week, they have just announced that uh, their new variable resistance trainer will ship in the fall of 2018 in September to be specific. And you can go to stackzero.com forward slash pre-order and pre-order the trainer to qualify for a 150 euro discount. And that is in effect until the end of April. So this is a, a great, great deal. And also still haven't talked to Andrew because I'm recording this basically the same day or the day, no, the day after I recorded the previous episode that you heard about, about this news. But uh, try the discount code TTS20, TTS20, because that normally gets you 20% off their standard trainers. I don't know if that's uh, you can combine that with this pre-order discount for the new variable resistance version. 
but uh, yeah, anyway, try that and see if it works. And uh, also, as I mentioned, you can order their current trainer version that is not uh, variable resistance. Uh, and then you can order an upgrade or you can basically, you will get your upgrade because it's part of your purchase as soon as it's released. So you will be able to upgrade the current version to that variable resistance version as that starts to ship in September. All right, let's get on with the show and hear the interview with Jonathan Beverly. Today's guest on that triathlon show is uh, Jonathan Beverly. He is uh, an author and uh, has been an editor of Running Times. Uh, his recent book is Your Best Stride from last summer. And uh, we will talk a, b- a lot about that and the contents from that book. But first, welcome to that triathlon show, Jonathan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, great to to have you. And we, we've had a recent uh, interview on kind of a similar topic with running form and uh technique uh, or and running injury free basically so it would be great to have uh, your perspective as well i haven't actually read your book yet uh, but uh, from what i can tell it seems that you probably have kind of a similar perspective to what uh, uh, the previous guest tom hughes uh, had on it but uh, we'll just dive right into it i guess and and see if if that is the case so let's start by talking about is there such a thing as uh, one or a right way to run or or is that just a myth well it's a really good question and 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 that was the 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 question that started me on the on the path to writing the book um, as you know your minimalism came with a rush and and told us all that we we had to run a certain way on our forefoot with a certain cadence and 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 this was if we did that we'd all be Kenanisa Bekele um, and then very quickly, very quickly that that got uh, disproven you know with science and, and experience that everybody wasn't able to do that and uh, and so everybody threw out threw threw it all out and said well the, yeah. The, you can't do that. Go back to go back to however, whatever you're doing and wearing the, the high heel shoes. And um, and I felt that there's something there, there had to be some some middle ground. Um, so that so the, the the simple answer to your question is there a right way to run is is no. Every every body is different. Um, I mean, it, you could think of it like like our voices. You know, my voice sounds different than your voice, both because of the length of my you know, like my throat and the, and the muscles and the chest volume and all these things, you wouldn't expect people to sound the same. Um, and that's the same way with your running, your, your, your limb lengths, the, the tightness of your joints, the angles of your joints, um, all the different elements that go into you create your running stride and your body finds the best stride for your body. So if your body finds uh, the best stride for your body, then, uh... We still see people that uh, are obviously not maybe running very, uh, very well, uh, if if we put it that way, and and people that simply don't know how to run for their body, and and what are the main reasons that 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 happens, and that can of course lead to injuries and and things like that, not, and of course uh, reduce performance. So, so how how do people? find a way that they their body should should run and and what are the things preventing them from do that right so this is of course you know once once i've interviewed you know the biomechanists and the coaches and the physical therapists and all and they said everybody runs their own way uh, it seems like okay there's no reason for the book we just call out and run and we'll all run perfectly right <laughs> and so but that's not that's not the case and what what i learned is that um the the problem is that your body is not your body. It's not the body that you were born with, um, nor the body that you'd have if you lived in in the the type of environment that you were designed to be in. You know, if if we were walking and running every day, if we were lifting and and carrying and and being active in in the way that our bodies were at one point, um, then then we would run naturally and and the way all the mechanics supposed to work but we don't you know from the time and you can see this i mean if you go to a playground and watch four-year-olds they will you know a girl will decide she wants to go from one side of the playground to the other and she'll jump up and she'll she'll run you know like like dear nurse de baba <laughs> across the playground uh, very naturally very lightly very comfortably um but pretty soon then 
she's going to be put in a schoolroom. She's going to be sitting for eight hours a day. She's going to be driving. She's going to be hunching over a computer and a phone. All these these constraints change change our our mechanics, our flexibility, our strengths, our balance, um, and and this is why we don't run the way the way our body naturally does. So, um, so there, that that's what the book is about is. Uh, how do you restore this? Um, not by thinking about it, not by having somebody tell you this is the angle of your knee and and this is how your how your foot should land, but restoring the uh, the mechanics and then letting your your nervous system uh, refine it, its its right path, its its best stride. And uh, before I, before asking how do we do that, uh, I want to ask: Is it <laughs> difficult? Does it take long? What can people expect? Yeah. It's it's difficult in the sense that you have to change the systems. Um, it's not difficult. Again, I think when people think about form, and this is this was kind of perhaps for the aha moment for me in writing the book is that we think you know you train to get faster. You train to to be able you know, your your lung capacity and your VO two max and your lactic threshold, but you think about your form. You know, like technique, like like you're swinging a bat or shooting a basketball. Um, what I discovered that the the experts all agree that you have to train for the right form. You don't you don't run incorrectly because you you develop bad habits. Now that's true. Once once you get a, 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 a form that's inefficient and and keep doing it over time, you do you know, dig that rut. But primarily, it's that you have to you your your systems. You know your your hips are too tight. Your glutes are not strong enough. Um, so you have to change those systems, and then and then yes, uh, it, it's it's a process of of restoring what it once was and, and what's a better a better type of stride. So it, yeah, it takes it takes months. It's it's not something you can go out. I can't give you three cues and you're going to run better tomorrow. All right, brilliant. So so let's get into that. Uh process a bit is it uh, uh, how, how do we go about it then if, if we want to start implementing the the most important things to to getting a good running form for us individually right so the first thing i, I think what happened was people the, the focus was misplaced on the on the foot strike and you know this of course when you talk to people about form still after minimalism they say oh well i you know i'm i i strike i hit my heel too hard um the experts agreed, uh, you know, from people like David McHenry, who works for the Nike Oregon Project, to Jay Shari, physical therapist, to uh, uh, podiatrist, that, that the foot is the end of the chain. The foot is it is the result. The foot strikes the result of the uh, beginning of the chain, primarily. So the core of the stride is the hips, um, and that's, that's where our focus should be. Um, and again, based on all the sitting that we've done over the years, um, our, what happens is our, our the front of our hips, the hip flexors are too tight, um, and they, and they so you're always in a flex position. You think you know you with your knees forward of your body, and then the the glutes in the back, the muscles, the backs both for power and for stabilizing just just start shutting off. Um, they they they're both asleep and and weak because they they haven't been used enough. When you look at it, this is one thing when you say, is there a right way to stride? There's there's not an exact way, but effective strides, if you look at at, at top runners, are, are primarily from the you know from the landing beneath you and driving behind you. If you, you think of a, a, a top triathlete running, their leg is in extension when when they're driving, which means the knee is behind the hip and they're driving backward. Um, you think of a jogger. Typically, they're in more of a sitting position where they're reaching in front of them and then pulling down to, to neutral. And again, this isn't because they, they learned a bad cue. It's because they don't have the flexibility and strength to do that pushing type motion. So the, the balance is all changed and, and the mechanisms are changed. So, so the first step is get your hips flexible. And, and that that's, is just you know, old-fashioned stretching. And in fact, static stretching, something you know we don't tend to do anymore. Um, but when you have to change a muscle length and, and, and its whole range of motion, then you have to, to to get in and and do like three to five minute stretches regularly to, to get that muscle, the hip flexors back to back to the allowing your hip to move naturally, you know, from from zero to behind. 
And can you talk about that length of uh, how long you need to hold that stretch for a little bit? Because I think that that's a common misconception that uh, people have learned to count to 20 and then that's it. But uh, am I right in saying that that's not enough if you're actually looking to to lengthen the muscle that you need to, as you say, hold several minutes for it to have an effect? Correct. Yeah. And and. I think that this is, and it's true. I mean, we used to do, do static stretching when I, I mean, I've been running since 1977 and, and before you run, you sit there and, and hold these long stretches and it's proven that, that, you know, before you run, that's detrimental. It actually weakens the muscle. Um, but if you have a, a, an imbalance like this, you do have to lengthen it. And yeah, um, Jay Dashari is, is uh, one of the people that I relied on a lot here. And he, he talks about that. I, I don't know if you know Jay Dashari he's from Bend, Oregon. He's a, physical therapist and biomechanical researcher but he's he's done yeah some yeah really- I, know, I know him and he he's doing some really great work and he might come on the podcast but he's just really busy with his so we've had a difficult time scheduling an interview but uh, right. he, he might come on in the future excellent but but he says you know yeah three to five minutes every day for several months and, and you know, that sort of blows our mind again we're <laughs> we're not we're not used to this type of of uh of work anymore we want something to work quickly but uh do you to, to lengthen the muscle, to restore something. I mean, you think about how much time you spend sitting. That's not a lot of time, actually, uh, to, to, to try to counteract that. I mean, it reminds me of, uh, of a movie, The uh, City Slickers, where the, you know, the old cowboy says, you know, you spend, you spend years getting wound up in the city and you think you're going to come out here for a few days and, and relax it. You know, that, that's sort of this. You spend all this time sitting and and contracting that muscle how do you think you're gonna you got, you got to spend the time to to open it up and really relax it now one thing i do talk about in my book is that it doesn't all have to be extra work you know that you do you know you add to your workout um one of the the key hip flexor stretches is uh is like a kneeling lunge position where you're where you've got you've got you know you're stretching your right knee so you put that your, your right hip you put that knee down you have your left leg up and then you get tall and tighten your glute and that opens up that hip flexor. You can do this in front of your desk while you're re- answering emails and, and the, the five minutes go very quickly that way. Uh, you don't have to add to it. So that, that's some of the strategies that I, I've employed. Um, and, and then the second step after you get your hip flexors loose or, or while they're, they're sort of simultaneous is to, to activate your glutes and strengthen your glutes. And so this involves things like bridges and squats and, uh, donkey kicks and you know, all these exercises, but but the key is not just doing them, but but learning what it feels like, learning what it feels like to have your glute activated, and and in a in an active way, um, and then that starts to work together in, in on the run. So, so about those exercises to make this uh, specific and actionable, do you recommend a specific number of exercises? Do you recommend rotating them or can people pick and choose one or two? How how do they go about kind of getting that glute strengthening and activation program very specifically designed for them? The people I talked to agreed there is not one there's not one that's perfect. Uh, and and the, the key is that you're doing them regularly and, and you're paying attention while you're doing them, that you're, it's a, it's a focused, you know, it's not a mindless, okay, I've got to do my, my 15 squats, but you're, you're focused on what's happening. You're focused on the movements, you're focused on retraining and feeling your balance differently. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not important that you do a specific one. It's important that you do them regularly. Um, and I think rotating is good just because they, they work different ways. Um, and, you know, some of the like side leg lifts have been proven to be one of the best ways to activate the glute, and it gets the glute medius, which is a which is a stability uh, stability muscle. Um, and then squats, and but doing squats properly. You know, most of us who are quad dominant, first time we do a squat, we can't even get in the proper position because we're trying to, to drop over and use our, our quads rather than sit back. And that's, that's something else that Dashari talks about. You know. He, Put yourself up against yeah. a chair with your foot next to the chair, and then and then don't don't let your knees kick the chair forward. And it takes a while, and then eventually you start feeling okay. This is what's supposed to be turning on, and this is how this balance works. And and that again starts working together until eventually you can do it on the run. Mm. 
and uh, so so those are so so we have the hip f- hip flexibility and lengthening right. and, and uh, glute activation and strengthening. Uh, what yeah. else? How do we then just try to incorporate that uh, in the running, or is there something else to yeah. the process? Yes. So the this the second step of this that was kind of like, okay. Let me add one more thing: is that I think I found a lot of people, and, I, and I'm finding more and more coaches are, are saying this: that, that the upper body, the shoulders, and the arms are also out of out of balance. Um, again, always forward reaching with the computer, with the driving, with the phones. Uh, we're always hunched forward, and we end up with rotated, forwardly rotated shoulders, just like our hips are forwardly rotated and 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 locked. So the, so the pecs on the front are overly tight and short. The the lats and the traps and everything in the, on the back of your shoulders are loose. Now, triathletes probably have some advantage here because you're because you're swimming, right? And swimming kind of opens you up that way. But but perhaps it's it's, it's still there. Yeah, but for triathletes, um, you really you should what you should do in your swimming is to incorporate backstroke. And I say this is somebody right? who hates backstroke, but it's really useful to <laughs> to include that in in your your workouts to some extent, like in the warm up and cool down and and uh, in the middle even and to to get that uh, to get those shoulders and and the upper body opened up but yeah go on <laughs> with what you're saying right right and so yeah, in, in, for i i coach high school cross country and every morning we we start out with with arm circles and then arm swings getting back and catching your hands behind you and pulling your your shoulders back and down um and then and then so there's there's some you know, limitations you need to work on and and then this is something that you probably the, the one area where you can do some cueing is is getting your elbows back and thinking about your arm drive you know your arm drive again it should be from sort of zero back you know, effective arm drive is 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 back and then it just recovers forward if your arms are, are driving up forward you know that everything is is out of balance somewhat that and, and then your legs are going to go forward so so that that's one element but as far as uh, then changing your stride uh, what I found that people agreed about and and one of the the Key research is a guy named John Keeley, is a, a UK scientist, talks about neuromuscular plasticity, that the, the, the central nervous system finds the best stride for whatever whatever your systems are right now. But then once it finds it, it, it does you know sort of create a create a groove, you know, like like sliding down a hill. It, the, the easiest way is to go in the same same path as you went before, <laughs> or skiing. You know that you're just going to be so you, you you create these neuromuscular grooves that are patterns and and that becomes a rut so your body has been running for say 20 years in this in this pattern now even though you've changed the system somewhat with the with increased hip flexibility and glute strength and your your posture has become more upright um, which is another chapter i talk about it's just changing your balance it, it all comes together that you you start getting your balance more over your hips over the over the center of your foot rather than and primarily on your heel so all these things come together but to change it you have to shake things up you have to say have a flood you know to to, to erase out the old patterns and and this is i think where barefoot running comes in um and going you know going hard on a on a technical trail um and, and doing some of the the form drills i, I think we, we, at least from my mind a misplace that the form drills are actually learning new form. I think the form drills are primarily to get you into different ranges of motions, different patterns, and and let your central nervous system then say, "Oh, wow, look, this is more effective." Um, and that's what I found in my own experience that it, it it's a gradual process of of learning new patterns. I think I think barefoot strides is is one of the awesome ways of doing this because it just changes how you land and how you move, and then it, it wakes things up to to the your central nervous system doing things differently and, and then you're in the middle of a run and you realize you know I, i'm sort of sitting back and 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 compromised here and and you can feel you know yourself lift up your hips activate your knees start moving back and 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 it and it works by itself it's not i'm thinking about this or going this cadence or this you know type of footstep so so how do we again getting practical here incorporate those things like barefoot running barefoot strides and and form drills in in the training program let's say you have a triathlete who is running three or four times per week uh what uh, what mm-hmm. would you recommend that they do or if one of the first things is is to make sure make sure you just go fast every time you run you know at, at some point you're know, towards the end of the run do you know three to four 
to 10 uh, sprints, quick sprints, 10 seconds, uh, full range of motion, just as fast as you can, you make things move. Uh, that, that again, shakes things up. It gets you, gets your, your systems looking for, for new ways to move. Um, and then a couple times a week, you know, finish, finish your run on a, at a, at a soccer pitch or someplace that that's smooth grass and clean, take off your shoes, do some, do some strides. I, I like to have, do, do some at, you know, at your race pace, some at, at all out sprint and, and some just jogging, you know, again, all different types of movement patterns where you're again, waking up your body to different ways. Um, and then little things, you know, once you get back to your shoes, don't sit down and put them on, uh, put them on while you're standing up. And so this is, you know, some balance work and there's lots of different things like that, that you can again, begin to cue your body to, to be aware and using different muscles. Brilliant. And, and what about those those drills? Is that something that you would do maybe if you once a week have a track workout, or do you? I know that for example, somebody like Meb, he recommends uh, doing them many many times per week, if not after every single run. Uh, but what, what's your take on on those form drills? I do some every day, as you said, and, and have have the people I coach do some every day, and then a more extensive set exactly as you as you said you know on, on the day of a of a track workout b- b- before you go out and do your your 800 meter uh you know, intervals or something you, you before that you do a full set of range of motion with the high knees and the butt kicks and the karaoke and the all the different things that, that get get your your body moving but we um a uh, lunge matrix. Have, have you seen that? Um, yeah, I do that. Yeah. But the Jay first Johnson thing on YouTube, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Jay Johnson's work. I do every single day. I mean, I, I just don't, don't start until I, um, and the other thing I've been incorporating that I've seen, um, is a leg swing. So a lunge matrix and then some leg swings, you know, lateral and, and, uh, and transverse leg swings and, and then, and then you're ready to go. I mean, but again, this, this, Get you out of the the seating posture, gets you out of the the stilted range of motion to get ready to run. It's funny. All, all of my injury prone athletes will know that uh, they have in their program before every single run, lunch matrix and link to that YouTube video by Jay Johnson, and then leg swings linked to that YouTube video, <laughs> and that's Perfect. mandatory before <laughs> all of their runs. Uh, so, so if you do uh, those sort of things, do what, what? What's your general recommendation? Is it before the run, or within the run, or after the run? Is there a difference? For these types of things, uh, I, I do it b- before the run. Okay. Before, okay. before you do anything, yes. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned there while we talked about the arm drive, uh, at, that that can be a cue to drive the elbows back. And are yes. there any other cues that, uh, that people can use, even though you also talked about not necessarily thinking about your form too much, but uh, are there additional ones in, in addition to that, uh, that elbow cue? Yes. I almost didn't put a chapter in about cues because every book of a form is that and people gravitate to that right away and think that's going to fix them. <laughs> but I did find, I think, uh, sort of universal cues are one is is run tall, you know, just stand tall. And that, that cues so many things without being prescriptive. Um, because if you can get your, your head up and tall, you're going to correct that balance, your shoulders are tall. And primarily it's, you know, your, your hips and your thoracic region. I mean, your, your, your chest comes up, and that pulls the front of your hips up and, and your hips. So if you can think about just, you know, reaching for a top shelf, in fact, this is one of the cues to start as far as balance. It's just reach as high as you can without getting on tiptoe. And so actually elongating your body up and then drop your shoulders, your arms down and, and keep that posture. And then from that, from that, you know, run, lean forward and, and start to run. And so even on the run, that's one of the things you can do is always think about just being tall. In fact, uh, I, one of the cues I did put in is a uh, golden Harper from the ultra running company. He talks about uh, just throwing your arms up in the air on the run. And I find that actually works pretty well. You know, you feel yourself being slumped down. It's just, just throw your arms straight up and, and let them come back around and, and it just lifts you up. And then you run tall. So run tall and elbows back. I think if those two cues, if you do that, that's that's pretty huge as far as getting starting to get into this posture that is is a more upright pushing rather than a, a crunched reaching and pulling. Brilliant. And uh, and another thing that we 
talked about there and uh, that is uh, the reason for the need for all of these books on running form uh, is our everyday habits of course uh, sitting uh, having that forward uh, position all the time with the computers and the mobile phones are there things in your book or just that you know in general that uh, people can do do small changes to their habits to kind of uh, uh, eliminate some of that detrimental impact that uh, this uh, these modern habits have on us in terms of in terms of habits, um, besides the sitting and the hunching, I mean, I think one of them is is wearing shoes. Again, I'm not, I'm not a I'm not a raving barefooter. I don't think that we're, we're in this day and age we're supposed to be uh, running barefoot all the time. But shoes do compromise you know, the strength of our feet. I mean, we 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 wear them in order to support us, but we, our, our feet need to have time to, to, to move and to open up. So I think getting your shoes off as much as you can, you know, anytime you're in the house, anytime you can be outside, I mean, even again, sitting at your desk at work, if you have, you have your shoes off and, and doing things like, like uh, short foot strengthening exercises or toe splay or, uh, picking up things with your toes, all, all these things are are very good as far as getting the, that aspect of, of your, your balance. Um, so this is uh, another part of, uh, I, I'm increasingly being aware of how much that affects your stride. Again, your, your subconscious is, is always working on on balance and, and foot plant and, and you, you, all, the, all the power has to go through your foot. If, if you're compromised at all that way, your stride is going to alter in order to, to save your, your feet. So this is an important part, again, of, of getting your stride back. Anything else uh, on, uh, on those? Anything on else? Of- <laughs> um, I think even like when you're walking, thinking about being tall and, and, uh, and pushing back, activating that glute is important. Um, little things that, that I, I have in the book as far as the, postural cue is that, you know, when you're driving in the car, first sit, sit upright, get yourself really tall, and then set your mirror at that height. And so every time then you begin to slump down, you can't see out the, out the mirror properly. <laughs> and that cues you to get upright. <laughs> That's uh, smart. Um, so I, I, I just recommend all throughout your life, you know, working on, on things to get, to, to keep yourself, I mean, as far as, um, you know, the, the the jury's out as far as standing desk, but I think you know alternating things just just as much as possible. What I I have is a you know a standing platform for my computer. I'm standing right now, but then you, know, you get tired there, and then it, I can just pull it away, and then you can sit down or I can kneel or uh, just just keeping things moving, keeping things more diverse, and then yeah, you know, as much as you can, doing things like uh, like uh, having if you have a garden, yeah. Working in the garden, uh, but but squat while you're doing it rather than bend down. Uh, just just what you would do if you lived in in a society like Kenya, or Ethiopia. I, mean, I think there, there is a reason. Besides, there's lots of reasons. They work very very hard, obviously, but uh, they start out a lot better than we do because of their lifestyles from from childhood on. Yeah, uh, about that uh, computer platform that you have. So, so that's the one, uh, the kind of platform that you you put on a normal desk, and then you can raise it and and lower it, uh, and it becomes a standing desk, even though it's not a big desk. It's just a, a platform. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. What, what's what's the brand? Out of curiosity, and so interested listeners can uh, go and have a look at it if you if you think it's a good one. Uh, it's it's actually a, a fairly inexpensive one, but. Uh... Uh, executive office solutions it says on it i don't know it, it, it's, okay. it's just got some some angles you know that you can click so you can you could change the the angle of three different levers yeah I, i'm interested myself because i i used to work with a, a standing desk when i was in helsinki at my at my previous my engineering job when i was doing that and that could be lowered and electronically and uh, and raised as well which was really useful so i did that alternating but now, since moving to to Lisbon, I tend to sit all day when when I'm not training, and uh, right. so yeah, I, I'm interested in getting one of those uh, platforms. Right. All right. Uh, what, one. Sorry, were you about to to say something? Uh, something? Well, I wanted to. Uh, the cadence is a, is a whole chapter in my book, and it, and it's an interesting 
variable that, you know, that there was time. In fact, when I first started doing this research, I wrote an article called It's All in the Hips. And I did at that time said, you know, one of the universal things is if you, you need to speed up your cadence. Um, the more research I did and more research has come out, um, Brian Heiderscheid of University of Wisconsin has done a lot of this. Um, that cadence, again, is, is self-selected by your central nervous system to be most efficient. Um, so changing your cadence is not going to make you more efficient. But it does alter some things. And, and you had mentioned that you have knee pain. Um, this is one of the things that if, if, you, if you choose a faster cadence, it does spare the, the stresses on your knees. Um, so if you are changing, so one of the things you can do is alter some of these variables just to, just to maximize, you know, to, to, to change stresses away from some of your weaknesses. Um, and so cadence is one of those that you can play with in terms of saying, okay, at this point, it might not be, in fact, he says it doesn't have to be a permanent change. It doesn't have to say, but, but if, if you want to continue running on a, on a, when you have a, a sore knee, you take faster steps, you're going to put less stress on it. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Uh, but that said for me, it unfortunately, it's not the solution because I'm already a fast cadence runner. I'm like okay. 180 on just normal easy runs. And 190 right. for my race pace and 200 okay. 210 for intervals so so right. I, I don't think that that's that's where i'll find my solution but i'll just keep keep digging uh, right what about shoes uh, is is that something that you talk about in the book or that you have opinions on i do i have i have a chapter in the book um and i i was shoe editor for runner's world for two years so i've done a lot of research on shoes um and the the primary thing i'd say about shoes is that they're not they're not magic i think we've we've put too much emphasis on shoes um and so i mean shoes do greatly affect how we uh first i mean how we interact with the ground and the different stresses there um how you push off i mean it's so they're they're hugely important but not probably in the way that i think we often think about them that they they first shoes can't correct you that was the original paradigm you know that if you get the, the motion control shoe the, the the medial post and all that that's going to to correct for for weaknesses and make sure you're not injured and that's not the case you you can't you can't put anything under your foot that's going to correct for weak hips um but second i the minimalism said i think that shoes could can change you that you know you put on a pair of vibrams and suddenly magically you're going to be running perfectly uh again that's not true <laughs> so um i think that the, the where we are as far as shoes ben O'Nig's research is probably the most the, the, the most current and and that is find the shoe that matches your preferred stride that 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 supports how you want to move and so when you're running on it you know where when you touch down, it touches down where you expect it to touch down. Where where, where it flexes is where you, you want to flex, and, and w- the way it supports, it feels it feels appropriate. It feels like it's it's supporting where your foot wants to move, and not not changing it or correcting it or or not you know sloppy, so you're so you're wobbly. Um, and, and then if if it works, then it works. Um, and you don't don't go to an expert to try to tell you or prescribe a shoe for you. You need to find the one that that works for your stride. Okay. So is there anything else that we should add on this topic of running form and running stride or anything else that you, uh, why don't you, by the way, tell us where listeners can find out more about the book and, and who should, uh, should get this book if they're interested. So you can find it, you know, wherever books are sold, I mean, on, on Amazon, there, there is an electronic edition as well. Um, if you want to find more, as far as my writing, I do have a website, jonathanbeverly.com. And and there's also there's a, a page there about the book. As far as who should get it, um, <laughs> and it's rather a humorous thing I say in the introduction that you know if if you are you live in a, a modern society, you're getting older, and and you want to run better, you should get it. If if you live in a subsistence <laughs> society and you're you're not aging then you don't need the book so of course that means everybody should have the book who wants to run i think yeah ex- except you're not on the bestseller list in kenya and e- ethiopia <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> and and the book is called in case anybody missed it it's your best stride so you can just uh, search for that and uh yeah uh, let's uh 
go into the rapid fire questions uh, and uh, take just one or two sentences at most to answer these the first one is what's your favorite book other than your own blog or resource related to triathlon or running or endurance sports i think probably the one that i've already mentioned here is uh, jay dashari's anatomy for runners uh, this is a uh, kind of the, the the scientific book that would stand alongside my book is is that he, he really has done the research and how people move yeah and uh, he's also got a new one coming, Running Rewired, or it may already be released, actually, which is kind yeah. of on, on this similar topic. And what do you wish you had known or wish you had done differently at some point in your career? Uh, when I was at the, the, the peak of my fitness, I, I was actually living in Belgium. I was going to run the London Marathon, and they asked me to be editor of Running Times, so they uh, they switched and I got a, a, a bib for Boston Marathon, and they came and uh, and they introduced me as editor of Running Times. I spent the whole week, uh, you know, going at the expos and the party, and <laughs> and uh, and did not run my best time. And and then and then my son was born, and I was editor, and I never got to that fitness again. So I wish I had just finished and run London that time and run my best time. <laughs> and what, what would you, what would you have run? Do you think? Uh, I, I I think I could have run a 240 at the time. I I I'd run a, a 34 minute 10k and uh, and it, it was fit for that. So so my best was then t- it was just 246 marathon that I ran in Pittsburgh a couple years earlier than that. Finally, who's somebody in in running or endurance sports that uh, you look up to and admire? Well, I'd say two people. Um, in, in terms of the, the the research topics, I think Ben Onig is, is just amazing. That he's because he 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 wrote the papers originally about you know how how impact of shoes and pronation and all that, and then later in his life finding that that the research didn't support it, changed his mind, and, and is trying to find ways that we actually can evaluate shoes. So I, I really respect him um, in terms of an athlete. Uh, Dina Castor is is pretty remarkable, both for you know all that she's accomplished and and her perspective on life. Brilliant. And as you mentioned, uh, your website is jonathanbeverly.com. So the listeners can find out more about you and your books there. And you're also on Twitter at uh, jbevrun uh, is your handle. So we'll link to to those in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to mention before we close off this interview? Thank you for hosting me. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Hey, it was a pleasure to talk to you too, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure that the listeners will find this very, very useful. Thanks again. It's my pleasure. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. I found a ton of great takeaways there. And uh, the top ones are hip flexibility and glute strengthening and activation. Uh, Those are the keys really to making sure that you can find your most efficient running pattern. And that hip flexibility, if we go a bit deeper, static stretching, it, uh, it, it is something that has use, and but you need to hold that for three to five minutes. That's something that Jonathan mentioned that he had uh, he had found in his discussions with uh, Jay Desherry among Jay Desherry. Sorry for that poor pronunciation, among others. And uh, Jay is one of the top experts in the world on on all things running anatomy, really. So you need to do that, hold that for three to five minutes every day for several months to really be able to improve that flexibility. And then as for glute strengthening and activations, do exercises like squats and and other glute strengthening exercises. You can find a ton of them. For example, on a related episode that I did an interview with James Dunn back in episode 45, his website Kinetic Revolution is uh, my go-to when it comes to finding the best strength and conditioning exercises for running. So, But you need to do whatever exercises you pick, you need to do them with concentration and with purpose. And that's more important than the exact exercises that you do do. So focus, that, that's the key word here. And my final takeaway was that there are a couple of form cues that are useful and those are run tall and uh, also run with your elbows back. So drive backwards with your elbows as you're running in that arm action. 
You can find the show notes for this episode as usual on thattriathlonshow.com and I've also linked to this specific episode in the episode description. It's scientifictriathlon.com forward slash TTS116. And if you have questions or comments about this episode, leave them on that show notes page. In the next episode, you'll hear an interview with Dr. Jordan Santos Conejero on a variety of topics related to uh, endurance sports science, especially running. But among other things, it will be estimating your lactate threshold and some modern ways to do that and do it more accurately than, than some current ways that we're using to estimate that so important threshold. One thing that I want to mention before we close off this show is that if you're not already signed up for the Scientific Triathlon newsletter, make sure that you go to scientifictriathlon.com and sign up because that way you will get you will get all the episodes sent to your inbox every Thursday or Friday. I usually post them and with some more key takeaways as well. So that's a great place to stay up to date with what's happening. Thank you finally to our great sponsors that keep the show alive. Stack is the go-to company when it comes to indoor bike trainers. I use their Stack Zero myself and can personally recommend it. You can find them on stackzero.com or you can go to stackzero.com forward slash pre-order if you want that smart trainer variable resistance version. And uh, again, there's a discount code TTS20 that gives you 20% off any of their current trainers and maybe the, uh, the pre-order, I'm not sure, but you will get 150 euros off anyway on that uh, variable resistance unit if you order within April. And thank you to Precision Hydration. They are the sweat experts. They will keep you hydrated and get you hydrated in the first place. To find out how you should hydrate with electrolytes, go and take their free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com and that will also help you when you get your first uh, box or tube of precision hydration electrolytes for free on precisionhydration.com. You can pick your specific strength that you need for, for your sweat sodium content and for your sweat rate. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlons.